Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hewlett Library and today's program called Black Scientists We Should Know. Uh, my name is Dr. Bill Fairfelder, and I'll be your host today. For those who don't know me, I'm a retired professor of arts and humanities. I currently live in Portland, Oregon, where I'm speaking to you today from today, and uh, I'm a lecturer, writer, and artist here, but I also make it back annually to my hometown of New York City to continue my work as a docent and a fossil explainer at the American Museum of Natural History. Now, because we cannot fit everything into a 60 or so minute presentation, uh, I invite you to take a deeper dive into today's topic at my website, which is makingwings.net. And I'm going to click that on. And hopefully you are now seeing that page. And uh, if you go to my website, just go to the hamburger menu in the upper right corner. And what you're going to see are a variety of topics and a whole bunch of stuff here. But you're going to see in the middle here a whole bunch of things called deeper dives. For every presentation that I give at a library or a museum, wherever, uh, I also create a corresponding page on my website. And in this case, I invite you to click on the chevron and go to deeper dive number 12. So that's uh, makingwings.net deeper dive number 12. And what you'll be brought to is a page, Black Scientists We Should Know, and what you're going to find are a bunch of web resources, printed ones, videos. Um, we're going to focus on 10 scientists today, and I have separate entries for each one of them. Um, don't want to make you dizzy here. Uh, I also have some recommended reading. So I'm going to be recommending some of these books during today's program, but you don't have to furiously try to find a pencil or paper. You could just go to my website makingwings.net, deeper dive 12, and you can copy things down there. Um, and then uh, realizing that these are not the only 10 wonderful black scientists in the world, I give a whole bunch of others with links to them. Uh, you know, I, I mean, there's probably hundreds of people we could talk about today. So uh, it was really tough to kind of narrow this down to just uh, 10. But in any event, uh, please take advantage of that, makingwings.net. And as I said, as you saw on my website, I have a section devoted to recommended media, and you can copy down those titles from there. Meanwhile, as we go along during today's presentation, I'll highlight many of those suggestions for each of the 10 scientists we'll be looking at. Now, once again, uh, today's program uh, highlights only a few men and women. Uh, it's my hope that uh, what we say here today will, will whet your appetite. So let's begin. I'm sure that the names of some of these men and women are familiar to you, but perhaps there are some new personalities that you are meeting for the first time. Again, hopefully the links that I provided on my website will let you do a far deeper dive than I can today. Now, first up, uh, and we're going to do this in order of birth dates. <laughs> first up is Benjamin Banneker. Uh, Banneker was born in 1731 and died in 1806. He was a freeborn African American almanac, surveyor, landowner, and a farmer who had a superb knowledge of mathematics and natural history. Now, the restoration of the Banneker farmhouse is what you see on your screen. Born in Baltimore County, Maryland, to a free African American woman and a former slave. Banneker had little or no formal education and was largely self-taught, which, which makes his accomplishments all the more remarkable. 
Well, around 1753, when he's about 21 years old, Benneker reportedly completed a wooden clock that struck on the hour. He appears to have modeled his clock from a borrowed park pocket watch by carving each piece to scale. The clock purportedly continued to work until his death. Uh, a replica is now on display at the Benjamin Banneker Historical Park and Museum in Cantonville's Maryland on the site of his family's 100 uh, acre farm, uh, which you just saw in the previous slide. And it was on that farm that Banneker developed uh, a very ingenious irrigation system. He became even more widely known for assisting Major Andrew Ellicott in a survey that established the original borders of the District of Columbia, which would become the federal capital uh, district, obviously, of the United States. And we're going to talk more about that in a little video clip in a moment. Now, Banneker's knowledge of astronomy, again, self-taught, helped him write a commercially successful series of almanacs in the early 1790s. His ability to predict tides and phases of the moon proved invaluable to local Je uh, Chesapeake fishermen, um, the Chesapeake Bay fishermen. He also, interesting thing, he corresponded with Thomas Jefferson on, quite ironically, if you know Jefferson's story, the topics of slavery and racial equality. Now, abolitionists and advocates of racial equality promoted and praised Benneker's works. Now, tragedy, right? There was a fire on the day of Banneker's funeral that destroyed many of his papers and belongings, including that famous wooden clock. But one of his journals and several of his remaining artifacts were preserved. Thank goodness, right? Again, there's so much more to this man's life. And you, again, you can find links on my website. But I do recommend a biography uh, by Charles Cerami uh, that gives a very fair and well-written overview of Benneker's life. Now, here's a short overview about Benneker from the Biography Channel. Um, you may have to adjust the sound on your devices, and there is reasonably accurate closed captioning. As you probably know, closed captioning on YouTube is catch as catch can. Uh, sometimes it's terrible and sometimes it's good. This is pretty good. Taylor Fox. Okay, here we go. Benjamin Banneker can best be described as a mold breaker. He was born in 1731 in Ellicott's Mills, Maryland. As a child, he attended a Quaker school, one of the few instances that offered integrated education, and he put what he learned into practice. At just 15, he developed an irrigation system for his family farm. When he was 21, a friend gave him a pocket watch, which he promptly took apart to figure out how it worked. But he was not fully satisfied by understanding the mechanism. He needed to make his own. So Banneker built his own clock from scratch. And it was so well engineered and the mechanism so precise that it struck on the hour, every hour, for the next 40 years. Banneker's clock gave him a reputation, catching the eye of a famous clockmaker, Joseph Ellicott. He helped Ellicott build a complicated clock. And in return, Ellicott loaned him scientific books and instruments for astronomical study. He taught himself everything there was to know about science and math, particularly astronomy. He began using what he learned to predict weather patterns and plan agricultural methods. He even predicted a solar eclipse in 1789, successfully contradicting many notable minds at the time. Seeing the practical applications of his work, Banneker began publishing Benjamin Banneker's Almanac in 1792, and it was a wild success. It contained information on weather patterns, farming practices, and was basically a how-to guide for agricultural life. The almanac also included political writings, such as a plan of a peace office for the United States, which caught the attention of Thomas Jefferson, and the two exchanged several letters. Banneker even implored Jefferson about the evil of slavery, advocating for abolition. When it came time for President Washington to appoint a commission to survey the site of the new capital, Washington, D.C., 
Jefferson made sure Banneker's name was on the short list. Banneker worked closely with French architect Pierre L'Enfant to plan the capital. But L'Enfant was notoriously difficult to work with and was known for his explosive temper. As a result, L'Enfant was dismissed from his post before planning could be completed. And in what could have been a devastating move, L'Enfant took a year's worth of the plans with him. Just when it seemed that the team would have to start from scratch, Banneker saved the day and the capital. In two days, Banneker recreated L'Enfant's designs entirely from memory. He redrew every street and stream and building, effectively saving the capital as we know it. Banneker died in 1806 at the ripe old age of 75. So next time you're in Washington, D.C., the next time your dad refers you to the Farmer's Almanac for all the information you could ever need, remember that we owe that and so much more to Benjamin Banneker, the first African-American scientist. That is a very fine little uh, intro to his life. Let me go back to this slide. Um, and it really is something for those of you who live out on the East Coast, if you go down to Washington, D.C., that wonderful floor plan of the city, well, you can thank Benjamin Banneker for that one. Well, now we're going, oh, yes, how can I forget? I want to include these, too, uh, for every one of our scientists today. I have a little saying and because I'm a sucker for positive affirmation. So I love this quotation from Benjamin Banneker. It truly seems to sum up his attitude about life and living. Never abandon your vision. Keep reaching to further your dreams. Amen, Mr. Banneker. Well, now we're going to skip forward a century and take a peek at Washington Carver who was arguably the most prominent black scientist of the early 20th century. Now, for many of us, I'm sure he's a well-known name, but I know from personal experiences in the classroom that at least 90% of my students never even heard of him. So um, it's, I always feel it's my duty to tell people about George Washington Carver. Uh, he's probably best remembered today as an agricultural scientist and an inventor who uh, promoted alternative crops to cotton, such as peanuts, and methods to prevent soil depletion. <laughs> I remember as a kid, every time I ate a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you know, my mom would say, thank George Washington Carver. <laughs> um, well, after being born into slavery in Missouri, spending a major portion of his early life in Kansas, and attending a blacks only grade school and high, uh, and high school, Carver was finally accepted as the first black undergraduate student at Iowa State University, which you see on your screen. Faculty were so impressed with his work that he was not only able to obtain a master's degree in science, but became Iowa State's first black professor. Well, in 1896, uh, the great educator and author Booker T. Washington invited Carver to be on the faculty of the Tuskegee Institute. And that is a position that he would hold for the next 47 years. Now, while a professor at Tuskegee, Carver developed techniques to improve soils that had been depleted by repeated plantings of cotton. He encouraged farmers to grow other crops. Uh, by the way, not just peanuts, but sweet potatoes as well, which you can see on the screen there, I'm trying to make you hungry. It's lunchtime by you on the East Coast. <laughs> um, these could prove to be a very valuable source of nutrition and could improve the quality of their lives, both physically and financially. Now he received numerous honors uh, for his work and his name reached well beyond uh, the black community. In fact, in 1941, uh, Time Magazine dubbed Carver the Black Leonardo. And the little arrow that just popped on your screen, uh, I recommend uh, Christina Vela's biography of Carver for a detailed look at his life. 
Um, I tried to find the front cover of that Time magazine, and I was not having much luck. Uh, but in 41, uh, they labeled him the Black Leonardo. Now, here's a great quote from Carver. I, I really like this one. How far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and strong. Because someday in your life, you will have been all of these. Boy, ain't that the truth. <laughs> now, as I've said, uh, today's presentation is something of a Perillo tour, you know, blink an eye, you miss a Da Vinci. But my hope is that even if you know some of these people, you'll want to know more. And someone you might want to know more about is Ernest Everett Just, who was an African-American biologist and educator who pioneered many areas of physiology of development, including fertilization, uh, experimental parthenogenesis, hydration, cell division, dehydration in living cells, and ultraviolet carcinogenic radiation effects on cells. Quite a list. Just was born in 1883 in Charleston, North, excuse me, South Carolina. Uh, he studied uh, at Kimball Union Academy in New Hampshire before enrolling at Dartmouth College. It just, just popped up on your screen. It was during his university years in the early 1900s, and that's when that photo was taken, uh, that just discovered an interest in biology after reading a paper on fertilization and egg development. He graduated as the sole magna cum laude student in 1907, also receiving honors in botany, sociology, and history. Like many of the people we're going to be uh, looking at today, very much Renaissance people. They uh, really were, they were polymaths. They were just experts. Uh, they were really good in many, many fields. Now, just first job out of college was as a teacher and researcher at Howard University in Washington, D.C. Later in 1909, he worked in research at Woods Hole Marine Biological Lab in Massachusetts. He then became the first African American to obtain a Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Chicago, where he studied experimental embryology and, once again, graduated magnum cum laude. Okay, I, I made a pause there, I'm very sorry. Something came up in the chat. Now I know you people can't see it. Unfortunately, on my screen, it pops up in the middle of the screen, uh, even if I move it around. So I would ask that during the course of uh, this presentation, feel free to write something in the chat, but direct it not to everyone, but direct it to Marie. Uh, then she can read me the comments at the end. Thank you very, very much for that. Well, as I said, he was the only person to obtain a Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Chicago. It was in embryology, and he graduated magna cum laude. Now, in addition to his pioneering work in uh, biology, Just also served as editor of three scholarly periodicals. And in 1915, won the NAACP's first medal for outstanding achievement by a Black American. From 1920 to 1931, he was a Julius Rosenwald Fellow in Biology at the National Research Council, a position that would provide him with the chance to work in Europe uh, where racial discrimination uh, was less, it was less <laughs> than it was here in the United States. But unfortunately, all was not well in Europe either. In 1940, 
when Germany invaded France, Dr. Just was incarcerated as a foreign national in a prison of war camp. But with the help of the family of his second wife, who was a German citizen, he was rescued by the US State Department and was returned to the USA in September of 1940. However, Just had been very ill for months prior to his encampment and his condition deteriorated both in prison and on the journey back to the United States. By the fall of 1941, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and sadly, he died shortly thereafter. And it's truly a sad ending to a brilliant life. Well, anyone interested in biology will want to know more about Just, and Kenneth Manning's 1983 Pulitzer-nominated biography, The Black Apollo of Science, which was a nickname he earned among his peers, is a great place to start. And again, all of these books and titles are on my website. Now, what I'd like to show you uh, is a short clip that highlights one of the wonderful legacies of Dr. Just has a little biographical information, but at the end, it really focuses on something that's quite wonderful. And that is the Ernest E. Just Youth Science Program, which is funded by the Bridge Builders Foundation in Los Angeles, California. Now, besides California, the program services young people in nine other states, including Alaska, Idaho, Arizona, and my state, Oregon. Um, I am uh, telling you again to please adjust your sound. Um, in this case, there are no closed captions. Ernest Everett Just was a pioneering African-American biologist, academic, and science writer. Just's primary legacy is his recognition of the fundamental role of the cell surface in the development of organisms. In his work within marine biology, cytology, and parthenogenesis, he advocated the study of whole cells under normal conditions, rather than simply breaking them apart in a laboratory setting. Ernest Everett Just was born in South Carolina to Charles Jr. and Mary Matthews Just on August 14, 1883. His father and grandfather, Charles Sr., were builders. When Ernest was four years old, both his father and grandfather died. Just's mother became the sole supporter of Just, his younger brother, and his younger sister. Mary Matthews Just taught at an African-American school in Charleston to support her family. During the summer, she worked in the phosphate mines on James Island. Noticing that there was much vacant land near the island, Mary persuaded several Black families to move there to farm. The town they founded, now incorporated in the West Ashley area of Charleston, was eventually named Maryville in her honor. The Bridge Builders Foundation named their science program in his honor. The Ernest E. Just Youth Science Program is designed to expose minority students to careers and academic pursuits in science, technology, engineering, and math STEM careers in a manner that combines classroom career instructions with field trips and fun projects and experiences. The program allows middle school girls and boys ages 10 to 14 to explore the wonders and fascinations of marine biology and science. The program is dedicated to Dr. Ernest Everett Just, a pioneering African-American biologist who received international acclaim for work in marine biology. The program has two components, the Summer Marine Science Camp and the year-long Saturday Science Academy. We salute Ernest E. Just. Well, there you go. It's a nice video there and it gives you you know, um, let me just go here and let me go here. Gives you a nice overview, but I think again, at the end, you know, that's a wonderful legacy. You know, that uh, when a scientist has not only a wonderful career while they're alive, that their legacy continues and uh, education is always a wonderful legacy. 
And now here's a great quote from Just um, that you just saw in the video briefly. And it, it tells much about a man who saw the poetry in nature. We feel the beauty of nature because we are part of nature. And because we know that, however much in our separate domains we abstract from the unity of nature, this unity remains. Although we may deal with particulars, we return finally to the whole pattern woven out of these. Hmm. Yes, in many ways, Ernest just was a transcendentalist cut from the cloth of Emerson and Thoreau. And then there's Alice Ball, whom I found out about many years ago on a trip to Hawaii. One day while researching Father Demian and the leper colony on Malachi, I came across Ball's name. Her story was immediately inspirational. Ball was an American chemist who developed the Ball Method, the most effective treatment for leprosy during the early 20th century. Let's, let's dig a little deeper here. Um, Alice Augusta Ball was born in 1892 in Seattle, Washington, where she enjoyed a middle-class lifestyle with her photographer mother, lawyer father, two brothers, and a sister. Now, after earning undergraduate degrees in pharmaceutical chemistry in 1912 and pharmacy in 1914 uh, from the University of Washington, Alice Ball transferred to the College of Hawaii, which is now known as the University of Hawaii, and became the very first African-American and the very first woman to graduate with a Master of Science degree in chemistry in 1915. She was offered a teaching and research position there, and as a result became the institution's very first woman chemistry instructor, and she was only 23 years old at the time. Now, as a laboratory researcher, Ball worked extensively to develop a successful treatment for those suffering from Hansen's disease, which we know as leprosy. She created the first injectable leprosy treatment using oil from the Chalmugra tree. A ball scientific rigor resulted in a highly successful method to alleviate leprosy symptoms, later known as the Ball method. And it was used on thousands of infected individuals for over 30 years until other types of drugs were introduced. Tragically, Ball died on December 31st, 1916. Horrible New Year's Eve, right? She was only 24 years old and she died from complications resulting from inhaling chlorine gas during uh, a lab accident. Well, thus during her brief lifetime, she did not get to see the full impact of her discovery. Oh, but what's more, Following her death, the president of the college, he was Dr. Arthur Dean, continued Ball's research, and he claimed her discovery for himself, calling it the Dean Method. Well, in 1922, six years after her death, Dr. Harry T. Holman, the assistant surgeon at uh, Kalahai Hospital, uh, see that on your map, uh, your uh, screen there, uh, who originally encouraged Ball to uh, explore a Chalmogra oil, published a paper giving Ball the proper credit she deserved. Well, even so, Ball remained largely forgotten from the scientific uh, community only until recently. If you want to learn more about her, I recommend a short film called The Ball Method, um, which is uh, available on Amazon Video. Um, it's, a, it's a little docudrama, um, about 15, 20 minutes long, and it is available, as they say, on Amazon. Now, our Alice Ball quote from her college yearbook, I wanted to you know, include this because I think many of the scientists we're looking at today would have this as their kind of their mantra. 
uh, th th this almost workaholic drive. Um, I work and I work and still it seems I have done nothing. Um, she wrote that in her science club yearbook. You know, th th she was just constantly, constantly striving. Now, another black scientist I think we should know about is Percy LeVon Julian. Now, Julian was an American research chemist and a pioneer in the chemical synthesis of medicinal drugs from plants. Julian was born in 1899 in Montgomery, uh, uh, Alabama, and grew up in the time of racist Jim Crow culture in the South. Among his childhood memories was finding a, this is a terrible memory, right? A lynched man hanging from a tree while he was walking home from school in the woods near his home. Now, at a time when access to an education beyond the eighth grade was extremely rare for Americans, Julian was able to attend DePaul University in Indiana. But the segregated town in which DePaul is located subjected him to many social humiliations, including have to, having to stay in an off-campus boarding home because the fraternity houses on the campus were not integrated. So he had to stay in a boarding home that refused to serve him meals. Uh, why? Because again, separation, you know, the separation of uh, white and blacks in, in eating facilities. And there was no black only uh, diner or place for him to eat. Well. In the end, Julian somehow found a way to eat, found a way to sleep, room and board there. And he graduated from DePaul in 1920 as a Phi Beta Kappa and a valedictorian. Bigotry followed him, however, and he finally had to go to Austria to earn his PhD in chemistry from the University of Vienna, which I've just put up on your screen. Well, back in America, he was denied a professorship at DePaul. I mean, this was his alma mater. They, he was denied a job there because they were, uh, well, basically they were prejudiced. It was for racial reasons. There's no other way to put it. And he was denied a job at DuPont, a famous chemical factory, because they were, quote, <laughs> unaware from reading his resume that he was a Negro. Okay. And he was denied a job at the Institute of Paper Chemistry in Appleton, Wisconsin, because the town was a sunset city, meaning no black person was allowed overnight bed and board. That one hits home for me because my uh, all my relations, uh, my parents and grandparents are all from Wisconsin and from Minnesota. And there's one branch of the family that lives in Appleton. And uh, frankly, uh, until not that long ago, it was a sunset city. Um, you could visit if you were a black person, but you could not stay overnight. <laughs> he finally though found work at Glidden Company in Chicago because of his fluency in German. Remember, he went to the University of Vienna, so he spoke German. Well, Glidden had a uh, extraction plant in Germany and uh, Julian's uh, language skills were, were quite marketable. Now, as an active scientist, he was the first to synthesize the natural product physostigmine. I had to practice that one, and was a pioneer in the industrial large-scale chemical uh, synthesis of uh, human hormones uh, like pro uh, progesterone and testosterone from uh, plant sterols. His work laid the foundation for the steroid drug industry's uh, production of cortisone and birth control pills. And his work with soy products helped to develop, among other things, foam, I love this, foam that was used to smother oil and gasoline fires aboard Navy ships during the Second World War, the things you can get out of a soybean. 
I do have one other thing. Um, I'm hearing noise, so that means somebody still has on uh, their uh, microphone. At, at, could everyone just make sure, check that your microphones are off? Thank you very much. Well, Julian ended up receiving more than 130 chemical patents. He was one of the first African-Americans to receive a doctorate in chemistry. He was the first African-American chemist inducted into the National Academy of Sciences. Well, to learn more, I recommend an episode of the PBS show Nova. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Nova. It's been on for over 40 years. Um, well, they had a, a wonderful episode called Percy Julian, Forgotten Genius. And you can watch it on PBS Nova's website, uh, which is available for uh, PBS contributors. Well, Julian became obsessed in the best sense of the word with soy products as witnessed in this wonderful quote. I, I loved it. I could never in my life imagine being so enthusiastic about soy, but God bless that he was. 50% of the weight of the soybean is protein. And what a protein. No other protein that we know of comes so nearly to the basic protein of animals and humans as soybean protein. He was an excited person about what he was doing. And that's what I love about so many of our scientists today. They were so passionate about what they did. Well, from the wonders of the soybean to the wonders of space, a scientist that more and more people are coming to know is Katherine Johnson. Now, I totally acknowledge that I'm a fanboy. Her life story absolutely enthralls me, and I could easily fill this entire program with details about her life. Now, a few highlights will have to suffice. <clears throat> First of all, that iconic photo of Johnson on your left was created for the September 2016 Vanity Fair uh, by Annie Leibovitz. Johnson was 98 years old at the time of this photograph. Now, we should all look so fantastic. Now, in a nutshell, Johnson was one of a few dozen women, some black, some white, who were hired as so-called human computers in the 1950s by the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Uh, there was a separate colored computers section where Johnson worked. Now, that advisory committee became NASA in 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Now, there were at NASA two computer groups, not racially divided, but divided by sex. One was male, one was female. They were both integrated, but not always without some tension. Now, although the female computers were just as skilled as their male counterparts, they were officially labeled, quote unquote, sub-professionals, mm. while males were professional status. So Johnson and her Black cohorts faced a double whammy. Not only were they Black, they were women. But that didn't stop Johnson. Her calculations of orbital mechanics were critical to the success of the first and subsequent U.S. crewed space flights. During her 33-year career at NASA, she earned a reputation for mastering complex manual calculations and helped to pioneer the use of mechanical computers to perform tasks. Johnson's work included calculating trajectories, launch windows, and emergency return paths for uh, Mercury, Project Mercury space flights, including those for astronauts Alan Shepard, uh, the first American in space, and John Glenn, uh, the first American in orbit, and the rendezvous paths for the Apollo lunar module and command module on flights to the moon. Her calculations were also essential to the beginning of the space shuttle program, and she worked on 
plans for manned and unmanned missions to Mars, such as the Pathfinder rover that you see uh, in the lower uh, right of your screen. Well, in 2015, uh, President Barack Obama awarded Johnson the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and her story and the story of her fellow computers became the basis for the book and the award-winning film, Hidden Figures. Now, if you haven't read the book or seen the movie, I really urge you to do so. It's a guaranteed dose of inspiration. I also highly recommend her memoirs, published posthumously thanks to her two daughters. Um, it's called My Remarkable Journey. What I'd like to uh, play you now is a lovely tribute that was posted on the NASA website shortly after her passing in 2020. Uh, as you'll see, her influence was and is remarkable. You'll also hear from her directly. And uh, this interview was made just a few months before her passing. She was over a hundred when she made this interview. <laughs> My problem was to answer questions. And I did that to the best of my ability at all times. I like what I was doing. I like work. I like dogs and stories. We were telling. And it was a joy. I think it was pretty well known that Captain Johnson was uh, an unusual person with an incredible gift. Katherine Johnson's story is an amazing story that had an impact on my life. Two things that just come to mind is her persistence and her determination. The story of Katherine Johnson and the other mathematicians that worked with her definitely had an impact on my career. It's people like her and others that came along with her that paved the way for people like me to become astronauts. Mm -hmm. That is a wonderful, wonderful tribute. Let me just close this up and go back here. I love that line that she says, I liked stars and the stories we were telling. It's remarkable. Uh, once again, I'm sorry, I, I must seem like a nudge. I have to remind people, please, if you put anything in the chat, please direct it to Marie, not to everyone because unfortunately on my end, it blocks the entire screen. Like right now, someone just put something in the chat and um, it, it literally blocks my screen. Once again, please people do not send chats to everyone. Please send them to Marie and she will read them uh, at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, back to our presentation. I love this quote uh, from the woman who is both self-assured and humble. I don't have a feeling of inferiority, never had. I'm as good as anybody, but no better. And I love that she adds that at the end. That's just great. She's very confident, but she also realizes she's not better than anybody else either. It's, it's a great quote. Well, speaking of inspiring women, here's Marie Maynard Daly, uh, was born in 1921 and raised in Corona, Queens, a 
kind of my old stomping grounds near where I was born. Now, if you're one of the millions of people who get their cholesterol checked regularly, you can thank Dr. Daly. After graduating with honors from Queens College in New York City, she became the first African-American woman in the United States to earn a PhD in chemistry. It was awarded by Columbia University in 1947, and she was only 26 years old. Uh, Daly would go on to make important contributions in four areas of research. The chemistry of histones, which are proteins in the nuclei of cells, protein synthesis, the relation between creatine and muscle cells, and the relationship among cholesterol, hypertension, and heart disease. Okay. I know all four of those all too well. <laughs> she taught at Howard University, worked at the Rockefeller Institute in New York, and taught biochemistry at the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University. And in 1960, she became a professor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where she remained until her retirement in 1986. Now, in addition to her research, Daly was committed to developing programs to increase the enrollment of minority students in medical school and graduate science programs. Again, that's our theme of education that we're seeing running through our program today. In 1988, she established a scholarship fund for African-American science students at Queens College in honor of her father, who had been unable to finish his college degree because of the lack of funds. So he couldn't finish his degree. So she says, you know something, I don't wanna see that happen to anybody else. So I'm starting a scholarship so people can finish their degree. Now, unfortunately, there aren't many books or videos about Marie Daly, but I was able to find these two web resources, both aimed for younger audiences. Uh, Emmy Cuisin's uh, Marie, the Fantastic Biochemist, and an overview of her life's work as part of the Women in Science series uh, produced by Sci Illustrate Stories. Uh, they're both uh, on my website. So if anyone here today wants to take up the challenge, there's a book-length biography just waiting to be written. And here's our inspirational quote uh, from Marie Daly. Successful people are those who failed and kept going. <laughs> Amen. Well, keeping with our theme of African-American women scientists, we should know, here's Gladys May West, born in 1930 and still going strong at 92. West was born in rural Virginia where her parents owned a small farm in an area populated mostly by sharecroppers. In her community, the only clear options for a young black girl's future were continuing to farm or working at the local tobacco processing plant. But at school, her talent for learning offered another path. As valedictorian, of her high school graduating class, Gladys received a full scholarship to Virginia State University, the historically black college where she earned a degree in mathematics in 1952, and she later returned for a master's degree in 1955. In 1956, Gladys was hired as a mathematician, a computer, uh, uh, by the U.S. Naval Proving Ground. It was a, a weapons laboratory in Dahlgren, Virginia, as only their fourth Black employee. It was at Dahlgren that Gladys met her husband, the mathematician Ira West. Later uh, in her Dahlgren career, West was named project manager of CSAT, S-E-A-S-A-T, the first project to demonstrate that satellites could be used to observe useful oceanographic data. Out of West's work on CSAT came GEOSAT, a satellite program used to create computer model of Earth's surface. 
Now, it is this model and later updates that allow GPS systems to make accurate calculations of any place on Earth. So the next time you use Google Maps to help you get to Aunt Tilly's house in Weeping Water, Nebraska, and yes, there is such a place, you can thank Gladys West. Now, though she retired uh, from the naval base at age 68, she continued her education. After recovering from a stroke, she received a PhD in public administration and policy affairs from Virginia Polytechnic Institute at the age of 70 in the year 2000. Now talk about determination. Like NASA mathematician Katherine Johnson, West is often called one of history's hidden figures. Individuals, usually black women, whose insightful contributions to science went unrecognized in their time because of their race or their gender. I recommend her autobiography, It Began With a Dream, as a great place to delve more into West's life and accomplishments. Now, here's a short video clip from the United States Navy's website, uh, a little homage to her from the US Navy, uh, that lets you hear from Gladys West herself. And by the way, she was 88 years old when she made this video. Okay, let me go to the beginning here. Come on. Go to the beginning. Here we go. When I grew up as a little girl, I was in a country area, rural area, and we uh, made our living by having a farm. I told myself that I did not like being out in the sun, working from sunrise to sunset and all that. So I made good grades in all of my subjects. So it's time to go to college. Well, since you're doing well in all subjects, you can major in math, and we know that you'll be successful. So when I went to college, I majored in math. Okay. Graduated after four years, I had applied for jobs in the government. I got hired in Belgrade in 1956. I came by myself. My husband wasn't with me or anything. I was by myself. I at least put it this way. I didn't know him <laughs> at that time. At the same time that we were coming to work here, they were also bringing in a large computer. And they hired these mathematicians to learn to work this computer. We hadn't had any computer teaching or knowledge. So we had to master this job that they want us to do. So we had to learn how to program and code for this big computer. My part in the global positioning system would be working more with the orbit over the water. A lot goes into the scientific computation to generate an orbit, which is a database used in GPS. So the different people who did uh, civilian applications learned to use the database that we generated. And that was the foundation that GPS was built on. When you grew up as a black girl, our school was separated from the white school. And we had separate buses. And many times we would get the old hand-me-down things from the white school. Books that weren't new, like their, their books were. But all of that helped to make us, I think, work harder. Because, you know, you were behind the eight ball to start with, you know. So you had to work harder. But I always was motivated by doing something new and completing something, having a goal. Because usually I had a mind of my own. I tend to think for myself, a little impatient with others who don't think the way I do. <laughs> I love that, right? A little impatient <laughs> with others who don't think like I do. Okay. But again, quite a remarkable, you know, story, is it not? You know, the the things, the obstacles that she had to overcome, not only as a woman, uh, but as a black woman, quite something. Now, West said that she knew that 
she was a role model. And so she felt that was an important thing for her. So in her autobiographic uh, autobiography, she says, I always made sure I did things just right to set an example for other people who were coming behind me, especially women. And she firmly believed that anything is possible if you try. Well, from Gladys West, uh, we go to James Edward West. Uh, they're not related. Uh, West was born in 1931. His parents wanted him to become a lawyer or a doctor because they saw those as possible, potentially viable careers for a Black person in the 1950s. But after serving with distinction in the Korean War, he won a Purple Heart, he went on to receive a bachelor's degree in physics from Temple University in 1957. In 2001, West retired after a distinguished 40-year career at Bell Laboratories, where he received the organization's highest honor, being named a Bell Laboratories Fellow. West then joined the faculty of the Whiting School at Johns Hopkins University, where at age 91, he still occasionally teaches and mentors in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Well, West's work has transformed the way people around the world hear and transmit sound. In 1962, West developed the foil electric microphone with his colleague, Dr. Gerhard Sessler. Until that time, most microphones needed a cumbersome and expensive uh, battery in order to operate. By contrast, West and Sessler used an electret, in their case, it was Teflon, uh, to drive the sound conversion. Electrets are materials that can be permanently charged or polarized following exposure to an electrical field. So the foil electric microphone, which just popped up on your screen there, uh, is now the standard in mobile phones, computers, hearing aids, and audio recording equipment. West currently holds more than 60 US patents and over 200 foreign patents. So. Uh, the next time you call someone on your iPhone or you make a Skype call or uh, watch this program on Zoom, uh, you can probably thank James Edward West. You're very likely using one of his patents. Now, I like this quote from West because it shows his deep interest and his wonder in the sciences that can be traced back to his childhood when he was nearly electrocuted and was saved by his brothers. Now, rather being, than being absolutely terrified by what happened, oh my God, I was almost electrocuted, I almost died. <laughs> his reaction, I became fascinated by electricity, just completely fascinated. I needed to learn everything I could about it. Hmm. Well, sadly, other than links to articles about his life's story, which I do include on my website, there's no book biography or memoir available. And, so once again, there's another challenge for anyone out in the audience today. Uh, trust me, it would be a fascinating pro uh, project for sure. And last but not least, we have Mae Jemison, choreographer, medical doctor, astro engineer, astronaut, businesswoman, writer. She remains a formidable uh, package. Jemison grew up in a small town in Alabama, but then moved with their family to Chicago, where she was watching lunar missions uh, on TV, and she was upset that there were no female astronauts. However, Jemison was inspired by African-American actress Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura on the original Star Trek. Jemison was determined to one day travel in space. Now, at the age of 16, she attended Stanford University as one of the only African-American students in her class, eventually serving as president of the Black Student Union and choreographing shows uh, about the African-American 
experience. And yes, you heard me right. She was only 16 years old at the university. Jemison graduated in 1977 with a dual degree, a Bachelor of Science degree in chemical engineering and a Bachelor of Arts degree in African and African American studies. So she had not only dual majors, but she had two different groups within the college, the science departments and the humanities departments. Well, after Sanford, she attended Cornell Medical School. Uh, and while there, she traveled to Cuba and she worked in a Cambodian refugee camp in Thailand. I put that camp up on your screen now in the lower right. Jemison graduated from Cornell in 1981 and after interning at the Los Angeles County Medical Center, she went on to practice general medicine. Because she was fluent in Russian, Japanese, and Swahili, Jemison joined the Peace Corps in 1983, and she served there as a medical officer for two years in Africa. Now, after working with the Peace Corps in Africa, Jemison opened up a private practice. However, well, remember that old story about, about Star Trek, right? She's still watching space flights, and one day she sees Sally Ride become the first American woman in space in 1983. And as a result, Jemison decided to apply to the astronaut program at NASA. And in 1987, she became one of the 15 people chosen out of 2,000 applicants. And after training as a mission specialist, Jemison flew, which came true, she flew on the space shuttle Endeavor in 1992. This voyage made Jemison the first African-American woman in space. Well, Jemison left NASA in 1993 and started the Jemison Group, which is a consulting company that encourages science, technology, and social change. She also began teaching environmental studies at Dartmouth College and directed the Jemison Institute for Advanced Technology in Developing Countries. Well, after hearing that she was a fan of Star Trek, it was actor LeVar Burton who asked her to appear in an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Jemison agreed and became the first real astronaut to appear in an episode of any Star Trek series up to that point. Well, currently, uh, Jemison is leading the 100-year Starship project through DARPA. Uh, that's the United States Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA. Uh, this project works to make sure human space travel to another star is possible within the next 100 years, hence the 100-year project, the 100-year Starship uh, project. She also serves on the boards of directors for over a dozen organizations, including, we talk about diversity here, the Kimberly Car Car Clark Corporation, Scholastic Books Incorporated, Morehouse College, and the Texas Medical Center. <laughs> Jemison is also a member of the National Academy of Science Institute of Medicine and has been inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame and the National Medical Association. Hall of Fame. In 2001, Jemison wrote Find Where the Wind Goes, a memoir written for young adults. But in 2020, she created an updated second edition, and that's what you're seeing on your screen, uh, that can really be enjoyed by anyone. It's not just for young readers anymore. Now, in 2018, Microsoft worked with Jemison the Smithsonian Magazine, and the intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum in New York City to sound a rallying cry for representation and inclusion in space exploration. Uh, they created an exhibit called Defying Gravity, Women in Space, um, a mixed 
uh, reality experience at the Intrepid Museum uh, that shared the stories of previously unsung women who've made critical contributions to the US space program. Now here's a video in which Jemison talks about that program. And it's really also a great way to add a very positive note to this program as we begin to wind down towards our conclusion today. When I was a little girl growing up, I was really irritated that there were no women astronauts and there were no people of color. I thought, what about if aliens run into this crew? They're gonna think that those are the only people on earth. I thought it was unreasonable not to have everyone represented. It's critical that Microsoft, NASA, that they're involved in promoting inclusion and diversity. Why? Because who decides which solutions are going to be tested makes a difference in how it affects our world. Today, we're able to get images and ideas around the world much more rapidly through mixed reality, building models, being able to share a 3D image of that model to people other places, it helps to foment creativity. We all have wonderful imaginations. So we need to use every perspective we have. And it's incumbent upon organizations with the wherewithal to make sure that they actively include people. One of the important things is understanding what you do with your place at the table once you have it. Thinking about that young girl in Chicago who just knew she was going to go into space, I would tell her, you have the right idea. Just because there's no one else doing something doesn't mean you can't be the absolute first one. And women have contributed to the development of this world for thousands of generations. And we're going to continue to chart the course. Welcome to Defying Gravity, Women in Space. I'm very thrilled to share with you some of the critical contributions women have made to space exploration, especially the shuttle program. So follow me and let's get started. I hope this experience, hearing about the women who helped to make the shuttle possible and space exploration possible, I hope that story sticks. And don't stand around waiting for someone else to give you permission to do something. You go ahead and you make your way. Doesn't matter about gender, ethnicity or whatever, because we need to use all the talent we have available for us to solve the world's problems and to move us forward. What a cool video, right? What a positive message. And here we have, again, I was trying to have a quote. Here we have, as you heard in that beautiful video, this is Jemison's mantra, and it's been her consistent message all her life. And it's the message she keeps teaching today. Never limit yourself because of others' limited imagination. Or more fully, don't let anyone rob you of your imagination your creativity, or your curiosity. It's your place in the world. It's your life. Go on and do all you can with it and make it the life you want to live. Can't think of better words than those to kind of draw our presentation to a conclusion. We looked at 10 of the dozens of African-American scientists that I think we should all know about. Now, again, please visit my website for links to articles and videos about each of these scientists and many more. There's so much more about each of these men and women to explore. <laughs> Happy hunting. So now it is time for your thoughts and ideas. And um, 